Uh, I'm Dr. Denbor. Uh, those of you that have never met me, uh, I'm a board certified and licensed naturopathic doctor as well as chiropractic physician. Um, and um, just this year achieved a master's in functional medicine, which is a brand new edit entity for the uh, health profession. It's a six year program that uh, gives uh, grants master degrees mostly to medical doctors, NDs and DCs. And, uh, and, and we're uh, really pleased to be able to, to keep expanding that it, uh, education um, for our patients benefit. Um, uh, Blake, who's going to um, uh, introduce himself uh, later, uh, says, Blake, could you please introduce yourself? Uh, uh, Blake Deephouse is, I'm proud to have him on board here, uh, and he comes very well uh, qualified, as you'll hear, and uh, he's going to give us a very unique perspective in the exercise field. So, um, I, some of you who know me well, interval training, as you know, is one of my very favorite topics. Uh, uh, it's, um, it's just fun uh, because you get results so quick. I can't, I can't wait to dig into this and show you how it can be done. Um, and uh, Blake will show you the nuts and bolts. Uh, so let's, let's take off on this uh, exciting topic. Um, we're going to, um, this, is, this is the uh, agenda for today. Uh, and um, we're going to uh, also introduce to you our monthly newsletter. Uh, we introduced this just a few issues ago. Uh, if you have not signed up for our monthly newsletter, make sure you do so. Almost a thousand people have already done so. It seems to be a runaway success. And every month uh, we give you pertinent information for that time of the year, what to watch for, uh, trends in healthcare, things that are controversial, uh, specials that might be oncoming, and we do keep it short because I recognize the short attention span on these things, uh, but you click on it and you have an overview immediately. So that's an that's a awesome uh, resource that uh, you, you can get to via our website. Um, and it gets sent to you automatically. So interval training and the professional athletes. We love professional athletes. When DBC started uh, 27 years ago, it was sports injuries only for a while. Uh, all we did was athletics, uh, and athletics was great fun. Uh, we did amateur athletes as well as professional athletes. The tradition continues to this day, um, but we have expanded far beyond athletics uh, because frankly, it's a um, very narrow, narrow slice of the pie as far as healthcare goes. And very quickly, we recognize the need as far as the inflammatory conditions that was striking down uh, our beloved United States of America even back then and has grown into this healthcare crisis that it is today. And that's a whole other topic. But with athletics, I want to, I want to revisit uh, what we've done for our professional athletes to give them in incredible results. And uh, uh, some of our patients uh, have gone on uh, against all odds to um, do just phenomenal things. I just was speaking to one of my patients uh, who was struck down with uh, lymphoma um, that was recurring that they could not get under control. This is just a few years ago. And uh, he just told me that he entered a triathlon out in New Mexico and uh, placed third in the nation. Uh, and that is just coming back from, from a severe cancer uh, and using mainly interval training uh, to get himself back on track very quickly. Uh, this is a really busy dude that has a full-time job and a half and is a busy father of three kids. So I'm, I'm really proud of what he could accomplish and he has been cancer-free for a year and a half now. So uh, it, it's, it's incredible to to watch how professional athletes in the cycling world, Tour de France is ongoing now, stage number three was today, um, and it was a bit of a disaster stage with all the crashes, but that's another topic. Um, it's, it's, but but it's, it's, they have really taught us in Tour de France, because it's one of the most extreme sports, how you can take your, your, your training time down by about 70 to 80% to even in some extreme cases for the real talented folks, um, uh, the three months before the Tour de France and still compete at the best level you can just by smarter training. If you look at the training techniques of 40 years ago versus what they're doing now, uh, it is unbelievable and most of it is due to interval training. So, so we're going to show you how, not how to compete in Tour de France, but how we can take advantage of what the wisdom from the professional athletes and how we can apply it to ourselves whether we're five years old uh, and that's exaggerating, uh, to 90 years old, and that's not exaggerating. So, um, and 
it's, it's, it can be done with anything in mind. So if you are playing hockey, you are expected to do interval training using skates. Yeah, if you're into swimming, you do it with swimming. If you're into walking, you can do interval training with walking as well as cycling. I can go on and on and on. And Blake is going to get into that. But, but I just want to emphasize one thing. If you're into tennis, say, yes, you want to do interval training that mimics what tennis does, but you should also be on a bicycle. You should also be lifting weights. The cross-trained individuals are by far the best athletes. And I've seen that in research after research after research, and even in the young ones, uh, the top athletes in the world. So you're talking to Serena Williams, you're talking uh, the, the top players in any field. When you study them, most of them were cross-trained until they were about 15 years old, and that's when they started specializing. I see a lot of parents today taking their child and thinking, you know, we're going to make this into a baseball player. She or he is going to be really good at softball or baseball and start them when they're age three or four. And those are the ones that merely get very good and go to an amateur level that is very good, but they almost never make it into the professional league, whereas the ones that were just playing outside, doing whatever they were doing until they were 12 through 15 and then started specializing, they actually are the ones that make it to the professionals. So there's a lesson to be learned from that. Cross training is very critical uh, and Blake will get into that as well. So interval training really improves aerobic capacity while also improving muscle mass. And may I add weight loss? It is the most effective way for weight loss. I get that question all the time in the uh, treatment rooms. How do I lose weight? And I always start with interval training. Then I hit food. Then I hit hormonal balance, sleep patterns, right? There's all kinds of things that are very important for weight loss. But interval training is the way to go, and I'm shocked by how little it takes to induce weight loss. It is so amazing, and that's because of the benefits of interval training, such as anti-inflammatory benefits to, you, to lose the water late, hormonal balancing, reversal of aging symptoms, um, and improvement in adrenal uh, function to increase your metabolic rate, uh, and yes, increase in muscle mass, which increases metabolism and energy, so you want to exercise. Uh, as well as decreasing cravings because when you exercise it seems like it decreases food cravings that you're addicted to and it happens very quickly so I love to see the changes occur within a week or two no the weight might not appear to be changing on the scale but they are changing how you feel because fats being lost muscles being made and that interchange does not reflect the scale so I tell my patients don't weigh yourself just tell me how, th how things feel yeah that's a really really important part of uh, when you uh, use uh, interval training for weight loss. Um, we're also going to get into why muscle mass is increased just by doing interval training. It's, uh, it's a pretty cool uh, way to do it. Time effectiveness is another really strong selling point for interval training because you can go in as little as four minutes and accomplish what a lot of people do in 20 to 30 minutes of regular exercise four minutes. That seems to be the cutoff. Uh, I've really studied the research intensely um, to see where the, the sweet spot is and one, any exercise is better than no exercise. Okay, so if somebody walks 10 to 15 minutes a week versus not walking at all, the benefit is actually measurable. And I, I have seen, I know that's ridiculous when you think about it, a 15 minute walk once a week versus total sedentary state reduces the chance of a heart attack by 27%. A 15 minute walk. Yeah, so, and that, that was, a, this was a very large study. And I'm sometimes a little jealous of people who don't, aren't doing anything because I know what little bit I recommend is, well, decrease the pop and walk a little. I'm going to see huge benefits, whereas with me or with anyone else that's relatively fit and healthy already doing these things, you're not going to see those benefits anymore. So, in a weird way, it's, uh, I'm a little jealous of them because very little effort equals big, big changes. So, but the time effectiveness is very important because I have yet to meet the patient who's come up to me and said, you know, doc, I've got too much time on my hand. Please design some exercises for me. <laughs> I've been in practice for 27 years. It has not happened. It just doesn't. So we have to try to shoehorn this into a busy lifestyle um, and really make it a priority. And um, uh, this, uh, this day, uh, on my books at least, it was quite, quite packed. We had a lot going on, my wife and I, and this and that, and we were kind of strategizing, well, if you do this, I could do that, and you know, you know how this goes. It's, it, 
and, and we weren't quite making ends meet and before you knew it there went our traditional 15 minute walk slash interval training that we do every morning and uh, she kind of goes Wah. I says you know we're gonna do this I preach to my patients if you can't fit 15 minutes into your into your life something is desperately wrong so we went and did our 15 minutes and I feel really good about that and she did too um, so, so it, it doesn't take much. Uh, so if you have that overwhelming schedule, 15 minutes, that's all we ask. If you have more, of course do more, but then that's icing on the cake, so to speak. I didn't say cake. So, um, and it can be done at any level of age. Uh, this fabulous large study done in Germany uh, showed that interval training and some weight training, so some cross training, in the over 90 crowd that was bedridden for at least a year, so was unable to function really in, in society any, any longer. We put a personal trainer on them for three months and the success rate was greater than 95% in getting them fully mobile and functional at the age 90 and above. See, these are people who had given up on life, right? They were under full-time care. And I'm thinking, it, that's just incredible. And as we'll show you the evidence from interval training, what it can do to reverse aging, it is actually just astonishing. There is not a single nutraceutical food or anything that's out there drug-wise that can do what exercise can do as far as reversal of aging symptoms. So that is our fountain of youth, and we're talking the fountain of youth today. And if people actually knew that they could reverse at least 20 to 25 years of their age, in just three to six months, really there should have been a line out the door all the way to the East Belt Line, don't you think? In theory, because this should be making headlines and it's not. And I, uh, uh, we have evidence that actually has become mainstream. Uh, some of the articles that I found on it were actually from New York Times that were extracts of research. So, um, so uh, let's uh, fasten our seatbelts, let's uh, talk about some of these things. As you know, I can never resist putting in the web of health, and this is, this is what functional medicine is based on. And you're going to go, well, okay, how is he going to tie that into interval training? Well, really, quite simply, the, the web of health involves all specialties that are out there healthcare-wise. Yeah? So we're talking your gastroenterologists, you're talking your cardiologists, you're talking your orthopedic people, you're talking all, all these people uh, should really be talking together about you, shouldn't they? But rarely does it happen and oftentimes you have to become your own advocate. Well, welcome to functional medicine because here we try to integrate all those things and we don't try to always be the expert. I just referred some, a patient be, just before coming in over here to a specialist because I needed some information that I wasn't quite understanding. Um, but with exercise, you are impacting every single aspect of health. And again, it does so very, very quickly. Um, and uh, for example, uh, let's just choose uh, well, musculoskeletal is, is obvious, cardiovascular is obvious, uh, but how about hormonal balance? Exercise reduces adrenal stress very quickly. It is measurable within minutes. The endorphin that gets released is very anti-inflammatory, which reduces, re reduces the load on the adrenals and it hits its reset button. Uh, Over-exercise, by the way, is an increase in adrenal stress, so that equals hormonal imbalance. And that's why, for example, female runners that go to extreme distances uh, stop having their menstrual cycle, right? That's hormonal imbalance. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a balanced, uh, healthy um, uh, exercise program. But hormonal balance uh, is, is uh, affected greatly just by exercise. We see a lot of Hashimoto's disease um, as well as Graves disease, which is an inflammatory disorder of, of the thyroid. And I'm always amazed by those that are exercising, we can get a response within three months versus the patients who are not exercising. It takes us 12 months to get them well. It is a phenomenal difference. It is a phenomenal difference. So, and that's just one example. Um, uh, the neurological and mood, a large study that was done again in Germany. Germany is a little bit, Northwest and Central Europe is a little bit the hotbed for a lot of this research because because lobbying there for the most part is illegal and so the governments there 
dole out government money to wherever uh, it seems like it makes the most logical sense in most cases. So you don't have undue influence, say, from a pharmaceutical company or some hospital association to, to do some, some studies just for their benefit. So a lot of our, our research comes from Europe, uh, although that is starting to change right now. Which, which I'm delighted with, but th this is a German study um, and it shows that with severe depression, we're talking the non-functional hospitalized patient who have lost even the ability to truly communicate what, what they're feeling, uh, they have trouble speaking, they are truly non-functional. Um, and we divided them up into three groups. This was a very large study that took place over a year. And they found that uh, the one group was counseling only, the other one was pharmaceuticals only, and the third group was exercise only. And you know where I'm going with this. The exercise only outperformed the other two groups combined. Yeah, and it did so within a very short amount of time. They didn't even have to go the one year. In fact, they cut this study short so that the other groups could benefit from it. So, so uh, it's, 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 again, shocking what exercise, especially interval training, can do. Uh, the, uh, and, and I wasn't trying to imply that there's no room for the pharmaceuticals and counseling and all the other tools out there. I'm just saying let's combine them and complement them with exercise because it's, uh, um, it's, it, it just accelerates what you're already doing. So just like, for example, my Hashimoto's patients, I would not ever get them well with just exercise. I'd like to think so, because the reputation is at home is dad thinks exercise cures everything. And um, yeah, partially true. But, but, but you have to need, you do need some other vehicles besides exercise. <clears throat> okay, so Blake, I'm gonna turn it over to you, because this looks like Greek to me. <laughs> yep. So, yeah, I'll take that, thank you. My name is Blake Deephouse. I'm an exercise science grad from Grand Valley. Uh, shortly after I graduated, I continued my education on and I'm a certified strength and conditioning specialist through the NSCA. Uh, I've had the opportunity to train a lot of professional athletes over my career, um, even right here in Grand, Grand Rapids, working with uh, Grand Rapids Griffins players and even Detroit Red Wings players. Um, as well as some other basketball players even from overseas. So my approach is, I'm very much like Dr. Denbor where exercise is almost kind of this cure-all. Um, you know, there's this quote that I really love that goes something like, um, people who don't find time for exercise and diet will sometime later have to find time for disease. Um, I truly believe that exercise is our fountain of youth and I say that to a lot of my patients because it is so regenerative. Um, so I kind of have three main goals that I want to focus on tonight and that's going to be to teach you about interval training, how to use it appropriately. Our second thing is here, uh, going back to our web of health, is how it fits in with not just losing weight and being active and being fit, but how it fits in with your hormone response, the cardio response, and your mood. So because it affects all these different things. So right, I, what I have right here is this thing called the FIT principle, and this is a great principle. Um, a lot of trainers use this, and this is what it stands for, it's a little acronym. Frequency, intensity, time, and type. Um, and this is kind of how you structure your workout. So we have frequency, you know, how many days a week are we doing this? Intensity, what's our heart rate at? How long for the time? And what type of exercise are we doing? And this is, this is a great model, but I typically tend to throw this out because it's, it's very true. In today's society, like Dr. Denbor has said, that nobody comes to him and says, Doc, Doc, I got too much time to exercise. You know, give me a program. Nobody says that. They say, I have 15 to 20 minutes. So this is our determining factor right there is the time. So if that's our determining factor, let's change everything else according to that. So we have 15 to 20 minutes, so that's gonna boost our intensity up. Probably, um, you know, the type can always change. The frequency will probably, we can go down to, you know, three times a week. Even one time a week, we'll see significant, you know, benefits and changes, um, but we can turn these things down by, you know, increasing the intensity and decreasing the time. So I let time be my determining factor on most exercise programs that I give people here. 
So interval training, what is it? How does it work? I think the best example is running. It's the easiest thing to associate with. So um, if we're going to do some interval training while we're running, we're going to sprint as hard as we can. I mean, we're talking, you know, full body, you're, you know, going to pass out or something. Maybe not that much. Um, but, you know, 10 seconds of extreme intense exercise followed by 30 seconds of, you know, rest. So our definition of interval training is kind of this intense bout of exercise followed by a light or moderate bout of exercise. So how does this work? Yep, I have my little cheesy graphic right here. So we have our guy that's just kind of nonchalantly, you know, jogging along. And then we're going to sprint really fast and then we're going to kind of jog along, right? So that's exactly, you know, one example. Right, one example for running, but this stems into anything: biking, swimming. Um, I do a lot of resistance training, and I incorporate this into kind of a resistance training program. So you can use it anywhere, and that's what's so fun about interval training: is it's it, you can use it anywhere. So you get this thing. You know, I, I mentioned sprinting for 10 seconds, light jogging for 30 seconds. You get this thing called the work to rest ratio. So those are some examples of what it kind of looks like on paper. It can be anything, you know, 5 to 4, 1 to 12. What it represents is a time for your work to your rest ratio. So for my example was, you know, 10 seconds of sprint to 30 seconds of rest or jog would be like a 1 to 3 ratio. So what we want to get into here is the why factor, because, right, we're saying, why do we want to do interval training, Blake Deep House? Why do we do this? Well, here's why. And I'm going to start with a study that was actually done in 1960. So we have this guy, Christensen, here, and he took two groups of people. We have our first group, and they're doing a continuous running program, so a constant pace for five minutes. We have our second group doing interval training, and they kind of split that up into three different categories of interval training, doing these ratios right here with the two to one, one to one, and one to two. So what they measured was their output or their distance running. So our continuous group running at a constant pace for five minutes was able to run 0.81 miles. Our other group, our interval groups here, going from uh, right to left here, was able to run two miles, three miles, and four miles, all in five minutes, same amount of time. And they have doubled, tripled, and quadrupled their work output. So you can see, just by adding in these intervals, we boost the intensity a little bit, and we're able to output so much more work. So when you're outputting more work, you are burning more calories, right? So this is our weight loss feature right here. We're looking at burning calories, our total expenditure of energy, which is the biggest thing. You know, a lot of people say, you know, we want to get to 20 minutes of exercise because once we do that, we start using fat as an energy source versus carbohydrates. While that is true, you know, it's kind of less important. The main focus here is our caloric expenditure, how many calories we are burning. So if we can, in the same amount of time, double, triple, or quadruple our work output, we're going to be burning a lot more calories. We're going to be getting a lot more results. So if you were to take, you know, if you want to burn as many calories doing some slow training, you're going to have to go on to that, you know, 40, 60 minute time period for something that you could be doing in 10 to 20 minutes be saving yourself a lot of time. But let's say you know, we carry that five minutes beyond and we do our interval training for 20 minutes, we're going to be burning so many calories, right? So it just keeps building from there. So this piece right here, circuit training, a little bit different, right? We're talking about interval training, I know. But I want to show you how these things kind of mesh together here. Um, so circuit training is kind of like taking stations, is what I like to think about it. So you have 10 stations with 10 different exercises, and you do them in a cycle. You know, you might go through it once or twice. And each cycle lasts for maybe 30 seconds to a minute. Great method of training. Really love this. You can just make it random. You can use this too. What I like to do is make 
my own workouts, right? And I'll take three to four exercises that are more intense and I kind of put those in a circuit or its own little miniature interval. So I have, for example, the other day I was at home, I did, um, I did bench press, I did some pull-ups, and then I just did some lateral raises, right? So that's my miniature circuit that I do, and that's kind of my intense interval. I go as hard as I can, as many reps as I can do, rest for about a minute after those three exercises, and then I repeat that. So you have this little section of this intense interval, you know, followed by some rest. So it's kind of like, you know, you're incorporating your circuit training with different exercises, and then you have a little bit of a rest interval after that. So, and I think I find that that is definitely when I see the greatest results. And it's, you know, a lot of people try to shy away, I think, from uh, resistance training. The big concern I get a lot of times from women is I don't want to get too big, right? You know, that's really not true at all. Um, it actually takes muscles about 10 weeks to actually build or hypertrophy is another word for it. So increasing the size of the muscle. So when you're getting stronger during those first, you know, nine weeks, those are actually more neurological connections using more of the muscle itself versus building more muscle. So that's another, you know, common misconception I want to address. So definitely incorporate some resistance training as well as some cardio. So we could, you know, take another example of you know, I'm going to do my resistance training, I'll do some bench press, do some pull-ups, and then I can walk, walk for a minute, right? So I'm still moving, doing a light bout of exercise, if that makes sense. So, all right, our next slide here, and this is what really makes me excited. This is the really cool stuff here, right? So, the anabolic hormones. These are what happen, this is what is released inside your body when you do exercise. So what I want you to see here is that exercise isn't just a way to lose weight, be in shape, it really affects everything, right? It's that web of health. Using it as rehab, a regenerative type of, you know, just regenerating tissue, staying young, that fountain of youth, right? So it's more than just getting in shape, losing weight. This affects our whole body, our whole system. So this word right there, anabolic, that just means building, right? So constructive. Uh, its opposite twin is catabolic, that's breaking down. So these anabolic hormones are building things up. And these are what I call the big three. There are a lot of other anabolic hormones that aid in this process, but these are kind of the three big players here that we want to focus on. Testosterone, growth hormone, and insulin-like growth factor, or IGF-1. So the first one here we want to hit on is testosterone. A lot of things that I always hear on the radio is this advertisements for men with low T, low testosterone, and the latest, you know, who knows what pill it is on the radio to boost your testosterone. Well, exercise is a great way to boost your testosterone naturally. And, you know, these are just some of the functions here of testosterone. We're enhancing our force production of the muscle. Uh, this protein synthesis equals this hypertrophy. I used that word earlier. That's building muscle, bigger muscles is what you want to think. So you have this uh, equation of protein synthesis, protein degradation, which is breakdown, equals this positive or negative number on the other side. So if we want to be building muscle, we have to keep that protein synthesis positive, right? We have to have a positive number if we want to be building muscle. Otherwise, we'll be going the other way around. So that's what testosterone does. It helps us build muscle. Um, and the other thing here, one of my favorites, is this growth hormone. It stimulates the anterior pituitary gland, which is a little endocrine gland in your brain, to release growth hormone. So when we carry in that, these are just a few of the functions here of growth hormone, right? It does quite a bit. So I won't hit all of these, but I kind of want to hit some of the big players here. So we have this increased protein synthesis again. How about this one right here? Lipolysis. So lipo is fat. Lysis is breakdown or to cut. 
breaking down fat, right? There's our exercise piece. A lot of people want to lose weight, burn fat. There we go, growth hormone, right? Let's take another one here. And I, I have a good patient story to tell you here. And that's going to go with this uh, cartilage growth. Regenerative, right? We're thinking that, fountain of youth. Uh, and I actually had a younger patient who had this, had some degeneration of the cartilage in his knee. And we did some acoustic on him as well. So that definitely helped out. But one of the things that I strongly recommended, him, re recommended to him was resistance training. Because re resistance training or high intensity training is regenerative, right? Stimulating cartilage growth. How does it do this? So let's take the knee. All of our joints have this stuff called synovial fluid, kind of lining the joints, kind of a lubricant. Uh, but we find that there's a lot of nutrients in that synovial fluid. When we undergo resistance training, something intense, we find that those nutrients within the synovial fluid actually get pushed into the knee joint, regenerating that cartilage. So, and the other side of the coin here is we find that sedentary people do not have that effect happening. So those nutrients are not getting into the joint, they're not regenerating. So what do we see? We see shoulder pain, we see knee pain. We see patients here for pain. So what I always promote is that exercise is medicine, right? It is not only preventative medicine, but you know, current medicine too. If you go to physical therapy, what, what do they do? They, they get you in, they stretch you, and then they give you exercises a lot of times. You know, light stuff, light stuff, but they're giving you exercise because we know that with exercise, it is regenerative. Um, here's another good one for you. Immune cell function, right? Enhancing our immune system. Um, so, you know, obviously we're a doctor's office, get a lot of sick patients, recommending exercise. And with everything, it's pretty much a, a bell-shaped curve. We have this area of too much exercise and not enough exercise. And if you're on either ends of those, you'll see that um, we'll take immune cell function, for example, that it is not optimal. That you're more prone to disease and sickness if you don't do any exercise but also very prone to disease and exercise, uh, sorry, disease um, and sickness if you do too much exercise. So we wanna find a good balance here, a good balance of everything. So these are just a few functions there. Um, oh, the other big key with this growth hormone is it's released while you sleep, right? So going back to our whole web of health here is we wanna make sure we're getting enough sleep we want to be getting, you know, roughly seven to eight hours of sleep. Uh, I always recommend, I think eight to nine is optimal for this growth hormone response because it's released while we sleep. So if we're not getting a whole lot of sleep, we're not getting a whole lot of growth hormone, we're not getting a whole lot of regeneration, right? You know, and it affects your mood too, right? If you don't get enough sleep the next day, we're a little bit crabby sometimes, I know I am, so. So the main point here with growth hormone I want you to take home is, is tissue repair. Exercise is tissue repair. It's regenerative, right? Not just losing weight, not just building muscle. Fountain of youth here. So this is my little graph. Here's our anterior, anterior pituitary gland in the brain. We have a response of heavy, intense exercise, some interval training. <laughs> That releases some growth hormone, goes into our fat cells here, breaks them down, cuts them, right? Goes into the muscle, building muscle into the bone, helps reshape the bone uh, into our immune cells there, enhancing immune cell function. Uh, going into the, bo the bone there, you know, take osteoporosis or osteopenia, for example, brittle bones. What heavy exercise actually can do is it reshapes the bone. So we're increasing our bone density. That's the big thing with osteoporosis is we have a weak or low bone density. We're very prone to breaking bones. So we can increase our bone density by doing this interval training or heavy resistance training. And so, yeah, it's a pretty big positive there, I think. Uh, the other, the last piece here, is it goes into the liver. So when it hits the liver, 
we get this, our last hormone there, our IGF-1. And what does that do? Same thing. We're going right back into the muscle, right into the bone, making our bones stronger, making our muscles stronger, regenerating. Some sort of those factors all play together. So when we exercise this way, using this interval training, we're not only saving time, but we're taking advantage of this hormonal, anabolic hormone response that you don't actually get with like slow training. If you take a, a marathon runner, for example, I don't actually really like marathons very much. Um, or that style of training and this is why is because it you get the catabolic hormone cortisol the opposite and what cortisol does is actually breaks things down it changes that mus muscle tissue to be more aerobic or much smaller you know I've when I see a marathon runner I don't typically see I think that person's really healthy you know it's they're very very skinny and I think we find that with health we see the best healthy people when they are cross-trained, when they're doing resistance training, interval training, a little bit of aerobic training, you know? The diet, all of it is a piece that comes together to make us feel good and healthy and not prone to sickness or disease. So here's my example of some interval training programs. Um, I know we have some beginners that you know, want to probably start doing this. So we can do very easy things. You can take anything. So these are some easy, easy exercises that you can do without any equipment at all. And you can build on this, you can take away from this. So this is my good example here. So start with some body squats. You can do this with either reps or maybe you want to go for time. Personally, I like reps. I'd probably stick with you know, someone like me, I might try to do 50 reps on each or something. And I go through it as fast as I can, no break in between. You jump from one to the next. Because then you have your rest interval where you're either walking or you're just kind of, you know, catching your breath, grab some water, get back into it. So body squats, I'll do a little demonstration for you here. Shoulder width apart with the knees and the feet. I like to put the hands right out in front here. You're just squatting right down. And the most important thing, as you can see with me, is as I'm standing, my upper body really, it doesn't change, right? The angle doesn't change. I'm not leaning forward, I'm not bending back. You wanna keep that neutral spine. So push-ups, right? If you wanna make this harder, right? You can push up, do a clap. You wanna make it easier, go on a wall, right? So you're not actually on the floor, you're pushing on the wall. Or you can go to your knees, right? That's kind of the next step. Go to a table. If you have a table that's this height, put your body out, just like that, table push-up. Go into a lunge here. So lunges, you can step back. Switch every other leg. Simple, just back like that. Uh, the tricep dips on a chair. If you have, you know, any chair, you're putting it behind you with your hands on it. Feet extended out, doing a dip. So if you want to make these harder, you can add weights to it. Uh, with the, like For example, the body squat, right? I can hold some weights, some dumbbells at my side. Now I'm squatting. So you can play with this quite a bit. But don't just use my example. If you have an exercise program already, you know, try to figure out a way of how you can section that out into little pieces, little intervals, make it intense with a little bit of rest, right? Chunking, make it in pieces and then put it all together. The other thing I wanna show you here, I don't know if you noticed this, but I have, right? Body squats, kind of working my legs, push-ups, upper body, back to lunges, my legs, triceps, upper body, right? Up, lower, upper, lower, upper. So while you are training one part of your body, you can allow the other one to kind of rest while you're still moving. So depending on what your goals are, you can change this around, you know, so maybe if I want to really hit my upper body, I'll do uh, some bench press, you know, if I'm focusing on my chest and my tries, you know, bench press, incline bench press, and then maybe some tricep pull downs, right? You're gonna really feel the burn through there after that. 
Um, that I would say is a little bit more of an advanced technique. If you're just starting, I would start with something where you're kind of alternating upper and lower body. So, um, yeah, so something like this, rest one minute afterwards, repeat the cycle three to four times, 10 to 15 minutes. Shouldn't take you much longer than that. So, now I'm going to hand it back off to Dr. Denbor here. He's going to talk a little bit about the genetic benefits of inter interval training. Thanks. Good. More to theoretical now. The practical is awesome, isn't it? I, uh, I think this, this stuff is so cool. Um, the genetic benefits of interval training. Genetic expression can be changed. Telomere length, which is aging, can be changed. And oh, perhaps DNA itself. And I wrote GASP in there because until just a year and a half ago, it was written in stone, DNA cannot be changed. What you are born with is what you are stuck with. Uh, out comes this research that says maybe, maybe you can change actual DNA. So changing genetic expression, what does that, uh, what, what does that mean? We have 23,000 pages of life story, right, our genes, and this genome uh, is relatively simple to even the common worm. The common worm has way more genes than we do. But they don't have the ability like we do to change genetic expression. And what exactly does that mean? Take the Native American. 1850. We've got our first photographs from them. A tall, proud people. Exceedingly healthy. Lifespan, if you take away the infant mortality part that was skewed statistics longer than ours very healthy happy fit right a beautiful people take the same tribe take a picture again today average lifespan 42 years short a lot shorter a lot wider in all directions usually skin is pockmarked looks are totally different. You barely recognize them. Same genes, different expression. And we all know why the gene has expressed itself differently. It's responding to its environment, right? Because last we checked, within the tribal grounds, life is not ideal. Alcoholism is rampant. Unemployment is rampant. Drug abuse is rampant. Poverty has, in, has, has given them access to just junk food instead of their native lifestyle. The Australian Aborigines have the same problem. It is a sad situation. And this very small pilot study was done just four years ago. They found a bunch of them, and it was, I believe, 112 of them, that all suffered from diagnosed inflammatory disorders, we're talking diabetes, autoimmune diseases, just real chronic degenerative western diseases. And these people were chosen because they had not yet lost the native ways of being able to hunt, fish and take care of themselves out in the wild. They airlifted them with their permission to the central part of Australia where they're originally from, a very severe area with no supplies except the weapons that they needed, the supplies they needed for hunting, and the first few days to survive off of. And let them loose for a three months time, and then with the agreement of picking them back up. Pick them up at three months time. All but very few had dramatically changed their markers in the blood work. All but very few had totally reversed the ravishing effects autoimmune diseases and this was not with medication this was not with just some sort of special nutraceutical it was through lifestyle and exercise they changed their genetic expression very radically so genetic expression is changed with exercise especially with interval training in more than 5,000 measurable ways. These ways include something called methylation. Methylation is more than tripled with exercise after three months. And what is methylation? It's how we detoxify. 
It's how we fix genetic ex expressions, how we change genetic expression. It's how we fix DNA, even cancer. Saw a patient today with very advanced melanoma who is responding incredibly well to our care. You're watching the tumor shrink and I'm just so thrilled about this. Today, the next project, because she was thinking of some fancy, what else are you going to do now here, doc? I gave her the instruction to start up interval training. Why? I'm increasing the methylation, which changes DNA, which fights cancer, right? It's anti-inflammatory, which fights cancer. It's relaxing. Mind affects health, affects immune system, affects cancer. We're changing genetic expression with her, I'm hoping, to continue that journey towards wellness. Genetic expression can be changed very radically, very quickly with exercise. And another way of checking this, a fascinating study was done just uh, about three months ago on what happens in a single muscle, because we were always wondering, what happens if you just exercise one body part? Do you, do you get systemic benefits? And yes, there were some systemic benefits inflammation-wise, but 80% of the benefits were in that muscle group itself in that region. They tested this by putting them on stationary bicycles, allowing them to bicycle with just one leg for three months. Okay, I would like to see the difference in the legs. They didn't mention that, but that must have been pretty profound. And they found that genetic expression, this is where the study comes from, over 5,000 markers had changed in that one leg versus the other leg. So in reality, this person had a much younger leg on one side than the other. Yeah, I'm sure they hurried up and started exercising the other leg after the completion of this study. So, yes, genetic expression, very changeable. Telomere length, what is that? We know it's related to aging. And telomere length is like a little rod inside your, in, right, right inside your cell that just goes, as we age, becomes shorter and shorter and shorter. So we always watch that it is one of the best markers we have for actual aging intracellularly. And if we can do anything to stop it, slow it down, or maybe even reverse it. Until five years ago, we didn't think we could reverse it, but that's been proven wrong, because telomere length can be reversed by at least 16 years and probably longer. We have two big studies on that now that shows that exercise interval training specifically reverses telomere length shortening. This is your fountain of youth. McMaster University, two years ago, published a study. This is a great research school in Southwest Ontario um, that is known for their medical research. And what they did is they sampled butt skin. Yeah. Now, why would they do that? Well, it hasn't been exposed to the elements like, say, facial skin, right? So it shows true age because you can age prematurely just with the exposure to elements. Not so with most people's excuse me, butt skin. So, I'm getting emotional on you there. And um, so, telomere length was measured and then they did 20 minutes of interval training three times a week. It was walk, sprint. Yeah, it was just 15 minutes, three times a week. And they measured the telomere length and the average butt skin had reversed age by 23 years in three months time. 23 years age reversal, folks. Give me anything else that can do that. So that is phenomenal. And then they found that the DNA coil itself is changing and we don't know how that happens because this is supposedly engraved in stone how our DNA helix is. We're born with that, it's not changeable. This is one of the fundamental laws of physics, so to speak. But yet we're seeing some changes and we don't know how that works. I am theorizing that the increase in methylation, which is how we fix DNA, also can change DNA. I'd be happy to be wrong, but right now that might be the best explanation that's out there. So with exercise comes proper eating. And yes, nutraceutical support. I'm wincing as I'm watching Tour de France. See some of these guys reach behind and grab a pack of goo, which is nothing more than sugar with some food colors in it, and just chomp it down. And yes, they're gonna get a temporary surge of energy from that. And I know you gotta win and that anything counts, but honestly, they could do so much better. And it starts really with the food that we eat. 
So if you are competing, by the way, do not change what you're eating that day of competition. The most common mistake I see with my athletes is, oh, I'm gonna really eat well today because I have a marathon or whatever it is, and here they are running a marathon with an upset stomach because they cannot tolerate the food that they usually don't have. So if you're eating junk food, please eat junk food the day of the marathon. Okay, that, that, so, so with that little aside, uh, generally when we do interval training, we don't want you getting sick. So it's not good to have a meal and do an interval training course. But it is good to have a little bit of fuel in your body. I like to, when I do interval training first thing in the morning, is have just a little bit of fruit. Making sure that I am hydrated. Okay, this is so critical because when you wake up, you are dehydrated. You su surprising much water you shed during the night. And hydration first thing in the morning is critical, whether you're exercising or not, because otherwise your joints, ligaments, uh, and muscles will not respond appropriately to the intensity of the exercise. Yeah. So that is key. Make sure that you recalorize yourself with proper food as well as hydration within a half hour of anything that builds muscle. You have to have protein in the half hour time frame. And this could be some, uh, some combination of plants. So we're talking the rainbow diet here where you're combining three or four uh, different colors of vegetables which can make a complete protein. Or if you take the easy way out, um, go with Vega Sport Pro, um, a Performance Protein. Do not use whey. There's a lot of whey out there. It is inflammatory. It affects sugar levels negatively. Yes, it's high in protein, but it doesn't mean you're absorbing it. And anyone over 20 can usually not utilize it real well. Okay, so whey tends to be very dirty. And it's just, I don't like it. I've yet to find a really good clean one that I, I can re uh, recommend. But Vega Sport Performance Protein is, is designed from plants only. It is a complete protein, like whey is, very absorbable. And today, it is considered the most absorbable protein on the market because you can absorb up to 35 grams of protein in one sitting without upsetting the stomach or load, loading down the liver and kidneys like those other proteins do. It also has L-glutamine in it, which is an amino acid and a branch chain amino acids for proper repair. And it can reduce muscle soreness by up to 30% the next day. It can make a profound difference. Uh, so proper food with your um, uh, ex muscle building exercise is critical. If you are outside and sweating a lot, electrolyte the rebalancing is critical. And Endura was originally designed for Tour de France for the extreme uh, uh, conditions. And Endura is the best one that I have found for recovery. Yeah. Um, and then coenzyme Q10, uh, this is the magic elixir for most athletes because coenzyme Q10 drives mitochondria, which drives your muscles. And coenzyme Q10, uh, you can feel a surge of energy that is almost immediate. Um, first time I was uh, uh, made aware of that is about 15 years ago when a stock car driver, a professional stock car driver came to me, he said, you know, I like to use coenzyme Q10 because it sharpens my energy, my stamina, and especially my reflexes. And I'm going, hmm, that's interesting. I started looking into it. And sure enough, it really ramps up brain function as well as muscle function. So a lot of my patients that do uh, uh, more extreme exercise do coenzyme Q10 along with vitamin C because that enhances recovery and prevents the degradation of the immune system, which is common if you're overstressing yourself when you go to more extreme. I always recommend the proper antioxidant. Phytomulti is the most powerful antioxidant multiple on the market, has been clinically trialed and one phytomulti is the equivalent antioxidant-wise of 25 cups of blueberries. It is absolutely amazing how it fuels the detoxification pathways as well as being a proper antioxidant. So you don't get that aged look that old professional athletes have. I don't know if you've noticed, um, but one of my childhood heroes, for instance, Johan Cruyff, he's a soccer player that was really huge. Uh, when I was um, uh, growing up in the Netherlands. Um, he's now in his early 60s, mid 60s, and he looks like he's been a chain smoker his whole life. A fit chain smoker is what he looks like. Deep creases, you know, that weathered Marlboro uh, look. And that's not good. He had a lot of oxidative stress from his soccer playing days that never was quite quenched, taken care of. And I'm sure had he been on a good antioxidant, including diet, uh, he would look quite a bit different today. Um, and Mito 5 is what we uh, utilize 
will enhance mitochondrial function, and this is for more extreme athletes. When, they have, when they're running out of energy, they need to upregulate up the uh, energy production. That's what MITA5 is designed for. We also use that for chronic fatigue, by the way, um, as well as chronic uh, uh, fibromyalgia, which is uh, muscle aches and pains and the degenerative disorders that way. So to get good at something, really it takes cross-training. And this is going back to the topic that, we, that we're talking about. Cross-training produces our very, very best athletes. Did you know that most of our professional Olympians do not come from the large schools in the large cities? They come from the small towns. And there's a reason for that. Because in the small towns, you're out there climbing a tree, jumping the creek, doing whatever you're doing, working on the farm, getting strong many different ways, and it's not until well into high school that a coach may spot them, and they're about age 15, 16 at that point, and then start specializing, and that's where our elite athletes come from. The ones that specialize early on, like I said earlier, only make it to a certain level, and that's it. Cross-training is where the sweet spot is, and what Blake showed you today was how you can cross-train in many different ways using your, your table, using your, your, your chairs, using your floor. Yeah, and yes, we can get more sophisticated than that, but that's how you start and you can get, become incredible at what you do. You can go for that walk and go into a quick sprint and if you're 90 years old, I don't expect you to sprint, but you can certainly walk a little faster and then back to slow again, even at age 90. Yeah, and if you can't do that, then get onto a, a bicycle, a stationary bicycle and do it that way. There's so many different ways to do this. Use your environment, do it outside when you can. Studies show that first thing in the morning is the best overall because of the time factor, because there's always something that gets in the way, right? And studies show that when you do it first thing in the morning, 72% of people that do it first thing in the morning are still doing it a year later, and just a little over 20% of the ones that do it later on in the day are still doing it a year later. First thing in the morning seems to be the best for most people because nothing gets in the way yet. And maybe, you're so sleepy that you say, you don't, you, I don't know, maybe you just go into this automatic mode. So whatever it is. But don't forget, hydrate well. Use proper nutraceuticals. Uh, and it starts with good food. The protein is absolutely critical when we're doing muscle, right? And we like to get our protein from foods first and use supplements supplementary. That's how we, that's how we look at it. Uh, and that's how it should be. So. Uh, don't uh, go after the genetic expression or uh, don't go after so well, uh, genetically I can't run. Yeah, you might be a slow runner, but that's not what this is about to make you a fast runner. It's about becoming younger. It's becoming brighter, having more energy, having an immune system that never allows you to get sick and um, increase uh, your gray matter. That's another study that was done on identical twins. Interval training can increase gray matter in your brain by up to 30% within four months of interval training. It was a shocking, shocking study that shows that brain can actually regenerate itself even after a stroke, okay? But even, these were done on healthy identical twins or one trained and one didn't. And gray matter increased dramatically when you exercise. So let's get some smarter brains. Let's get a stronger immune system. Let's not spend too much time doing it. Let's do it in the way that we love, whatever you choose, yeah? And let's have our moods go up. Let's feel younger, healthier, more vital so that we have energy to do the things that we do. Why not do that in just 15 to 20 minutes a day? It can totally transform your life. It can totally transform your life. And even if you're 400 pounds, no, it will not transform your weight in three weeks. But I can guarantee you in three weeks at 400 pounds, your cholesterol is going to be lower. You're going to be feeling brighter. You will be sleeping better. And you'll be feeling better about yourself, even though your weight hasn't changed yet. Isn't that worth it? Oftentimes we exercise watching the scale. Oh, that isn't working. Well, I give up on that. Don't. It's all those other factors that are absolutely critical. Fabulous. Blake is eager to answer any of your questions. I'll be here in the background also. Um, but I, I, was, I was so impressed by, by your presentation. This was the first time Blake uh, stood in front of uh, a class and it's like, wow. <laughs> it's like, like he's, he's a pro, he just does it, so I'm proud of you. Well, thank you. <laughs> All right, any questions? What about exercise in the morning without eating first? Without eating? Yeah. Let me hit that one. You want to hit that one? Is it, you, you go first, and then I'll... All right. Um, yeah. Um, don't recommend it. Um, what you want to do is um, uh, your, your liver 
needs to secrete glycogen when sugar is low. You are going to be low on sugar because you haven't eaten. And sugar is used as fuel for muscle contraction among other things. And uh, so you want that glycogen to be released from the liver because that's where sugar is stored. And in order to stimulate your liver to start waking up and start doing its metabolic processes, you should have something to trigger that process. And it could be as little as a small handful of blueberries. Okay, it doesn't have to be a meal. Uh, but you got to get something going. In fact, uh, there's a really cool study that just came out about a year ago uh, that shows with professional cyclists, we can fool them into not bonking. Bonking means your legs just turning to jelly, you're done. Okay, it's a very, not a nice feeling. Um, but you can get about 10% more distance by fooling your liver by having something sweet in your mouth. To prevent. So this, this is pretty cool stuff. Um, and so you got to get that going first thing in the morning. This is really important. Otherwise you could go into excessive muscle breakdown uh, and that's not a cool thing. No? Mm -hmm. Yeah, one thing I think I for, maybe forgot to mention, uh, going back to low testosterone and like say you want to, what's the most optimal time of day to work out? Um, I always recommend kind of like that three to four o'clock range kind of, you know, not doesn't really fit into the schedule that great, but we find that people with low testosterone, um, if you are looking at increasing your overall testosterone levels in your body, that it's actually better to work out later in the day versus in the morning if, you're, if your goal is to increase overall testosterone levels. But I would recommend exercise, you know, at all versus no exercise. If your morning time is your only time to do it, do it in the morning rather than potentially missing it later in the day. So. How many times a week do you recommend a workout every day or miss a day? Or um, a day? Personally, I look for something activity every day. It doesn't have to be a workout, something planned. You know, what I like to do is, uh, my routine is pretty vigorous. I do six days a week with uh, my seventh day is kind of an active rest. So I'll go play Frisbee or, you know, shoot some golf, something where I'm just moving. Um, so, but with an interval training, if you're a beginner, I recommend two to three times a week, something like that. Just get started, get comfortable, find a routine, find a time of day, and then as you get better at it, let's go to three to four times a week, you know? And as you design your program, you maybe you say, okay, this first day is of interval training is gonna focus on the lower body. My next day of interval training is gonna focus on my upper body. So you're giving your muscles and that portion of your body the optimal amount of time to rest before you kinda hit it and break it down again. But remember, any exercise is better than no exercise. Mm -hmm. Even once a week, you've yeah. got, and, and I see so many of my patients just beating themselves up. Oh, I didn't do it again. I fell off the wagon, blah, blah, blah. Make it ridiculously simple and hard to fail at first. Five minute walk, twice a week. Come on, you could do it, right? <laughs> and, then, and then take it from there. Just, oh, and I'm being obviously a little, little weird about it, but, but, it's, it's, but, but do what you feel like you can't fail at and then build. That's, that's, I think, critical because mm -hmm. we're, we're discussing what you asked, what is best. Um, but again, anything's better than none. Yeah. I walk 45 minutes a day, three times a week. Now, if, and it takes me about 48 minutes. If I could change that to in, in, interval, how would I, should I do that? And if I do, do interval, should I cut it down? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What I would do for you is I would cut that 45 minutes of walking down to about 25 minutes of walking. And so you are slowing your, well, you start with slow pace and then you increase that pace, you know, as fast as you can walk. Whatever that is for you, you walk as fast as you can and then you bring it back down to, a, you know, a lower pace. So, and stick to 25 minutes. I, I wouldn't really go, you know, beyond anything with 25 minutes, especially with the interval training. Uh, why is uh, uh, outside more effective than inside? Like, you know, like the doctor was saying, uh, you know, if you have a bike, stationary bike inside, can't you get the same results? 
than if you were outside. It's just more, in, in the winter and stuff, you know, it's more convenient to be inside. Explain that. Yeah. Um, Got me hit? Yeah, I mean, I, I can't. Go for it. Well, uh, okay. Um, you know, my philosophy, my point of view on that would be if you are outside, you are exposed to more um, obstacles, let's say. You know, there's going to be hills, there's going to be, oh, there's a dog on the sidewalk, I got to avoid that, I got to go over a curb. You know, if I'm biking, this is, you know, there's going to be obstacles in the way. It's more, um, it's, it's working your brain as much as it is your body because you have to pay attention to your surroundings, right? So, I'm training my balance a little bit more. I'm training my, just how my neurological processes function. That's getting better, right? If I'm on a stationary bike, there's not a lot of balance involved with that. If I'm outside, I'm having to turn, I'm having to do you know, whatever to get me to where I'm going. Um, so I think that I find when I run on a treadmill versus running on a trail, I, I'm definitely a lot more beat after running a trail than I am on a treadmill. Mm -hmm. But having said that, if there's a snowstorm outside, that stationary bike is mighty attractive yeah. and a whole lot better than sitting on your couch. Yeah, exactly. My point yeah. Is just bam, okay. You know, it's a lot of reasonableness. Yeah, yeah, okay. um, but also, let's say on a cloudy winter day, uh, going outside, there is no better way to stimulate your immune system because we know outside light hitting the retina has some magic on your, on your uh, immune system that we don't know why that happens. Um, a study out of Japan just showed that uh, uh, walking through a pine forest, just the smell of the pine forest has incredible benefit for neurotransmitters for clarity of thinking that is just not measurable for say working inside where there might be some toxic fumes from mold and paint and who knows what cleaning <coughs> solutions and who knows what you're breathing in at high vol higher volume so there's those benefits too yeah i've heard from um some of my friends um that and this may be more applicable towards weight training that every couple of weeks you want to switch up what your routine is you know if you are always doing a bench press then um, some other form of lift, you want to switch it up to do something else. Does that also kind of um, apply to like interval training? For like people that are maybe walking or running, switching to like a bicycle um, or anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I had um, a mixed martial artist that uh, was a friend of mine and he, you know he kind of had the same thing. He's like, you know I do my intervals on my stairs and I you know, it's become so easy, I don't get sore anymore. You know, he's like, why is that? And it's, it kind of goes along with what you're saying is, the body is amazing at adapting. Amazing. Look at a sedentary person, their body has adapted to a sedentary lifestyle. Look at a very fit person, right? Their body has adapted. A bodybuilder does a lot of resistance training, right? They're bigger, their body has adapted. A long distance runner. Their muscles have condensed, the cortisol is released, we see more type 1 fibers versus type 2, which is our explosive fibers. So, our, you know, they have adapted. So, my recommendation is always vary your training protocol. Um, I try to do something different almost every week. Like, it's similar, but it's different. So, you're adjusting the time, the intensity, the mode of exercise that you're doing. Um, you know, vary it any way you can you know it's just not to say that you won't get some benefit you know by doing the same thing week after week but you can see better results by doing something different all the time right we're going back to that cross training well-developed athlete right they have all these different pieces because they're but they don't allow their body to really adapt in any one situation so they're really good at everything right they're a jack of all trades but maybe a master of none but we find that with these jack of all trades it's kind of the optimal health level. The point was really struck, struck home to me, and I, now I understand why. When I was, uh, I was uh, just for fun, our track and field team put me again, uh, doing a 100 meter race against our 10,000 meter, uh, uh, basically the equivalent of an all-state champion. Um, and so this, uh, um, th th this fella um, went on to have a very successful career in the 10,000 meters, so extremely gifted. So they just wanted to see what a sprint 
of a 10,000 meter versus a 100 meter, and of course, I, I, I of course beat him. I mean, that, that goes without saying. But what we were shocked at was that his all out 100 meter sprint was barely faster than what he does the entire 10,000 meters. I remember just, just looking at him with disbelief. You, really, you, you, you can't run faster? It, <laughs> what, what's going on? This, to, to, me, this, I, to, to me, I thought he was faking it. Uh, but now I know he has not because he had gotten done one thing so well so long that his muscles had shortened to the point of being very inflexible. So it's like a coil spring. So it's very little effort with running. And his Achilles tendon, in retrospect now, is about two inches longer than mine. Instead of just being a short Achilles tendon, it goes all the way over here. So he has more of a coil and everything. And the worst thing you could have done with that guy is put him in yoga classes because he would have lost that coilness, right? The, the, the elasticity, the efficiency. That's why with my long distance competitors, I don't make them stretch because I know I'm, I'll be hurting their performance. So, it, so, so sometimes we get messed up with a professional athlete who trains a certain way, but you gotta remember that's just for that one thing. And that does not make a very healthy athlete because if you can't even do the various things you're supposed to do, but you're only good at one thing, that to me is not health. So what we're talking about today is health, fitness, vitality being able to go underneath the sink and do some wrenching, that, that type of thing. That's just a, an everyday example. Does, does that make sense? And sometimes we get caught up in hearing, well, this, this person's training this way and this way and this way. Yeah, that's good for that particular slice. Um, but you don't want to be that way. All right. I think we've stunned you into silence. <laughs> and it's time to go home and enjoy just a little bit left of a summer evening. Thank you so much for coming. It's always really appreciated. And um, we're, um, we're thrilled to disperse some of this information to you. And um, any questions you might have, we'll, we'll stick around a little bit afterwards. Thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm.